And, and when we were starting the company, we spoke to a huge amount of industry participants, like software companies, um, automotive OEMs, motorsports companies. And what we realized is actually all of these companies were repeating a very similar activity in-house, which is they're buying batteries, they're testing them, they, they use the data to build these models. And it's actually a very difficult process, like testing and modeling batteries is actually very, very, very difficult. So, so we've seen the opportunity to centralize this and drive down the cost for our customers. Can you imagine having to build 10 different battery packs in real life with all the safety, the manufacturing? So it's, yeah, a couple of days or a couple of weeks of simulation compared to, you know, months or even years of having to do that in real life. Welcome back to Battery Generation, your e-mobility podcast for European battery research. Dear listeners, good to be back in 2024. We got some pretty exciting speakers from all over Europe coming up here in the next weeks. Today we're starting with an amazing young engineer from Great Britain. Welcome to Battery Generation podcast, Gavin White. Thank you very much, Patrick. It's a pleasure to be on the show. Gavin, you are the CEO of About Energy, a battery software company from London, UK. We're talking about some pretty smart products of yours to help building up the European battery market. Gavin, let me start with the following. You have seen and tested hundreds of different battery cells, different formats, different chemistries, different manufacturers from Asia, from the US and even Europe. Who or what company is building the best battery cells as of right now? I think that's a great uh, question, Patrick, and a very, very difficult one to answer. And to answer, I guess we really need to understand how batteries are used. Um, there's a reason that there's hundreds of different batteries on the market, and it's because they're all slightly different, and the nuance and difference is very small, but they all focus on a different target application. So depending on your application, there is a different perfect battery for you. So I guess the simple answer to that question is that in their own respects, each of them is great. The question is what one is great for you? And that's the very difficult question to answer and one that we, um, we are trying to help people solve. Could you probably differentiate between countries or continents? It's always said that the Asians are best at building all kinds of battery cells and Europeans are let's say we're starting to build up our industry sector here. Is that true? Yeah, well, I, I guess the way I see it, um, my personal opinion is that Asia is really dominating now the, the low cost market. They're able to produce cells at extremely high volume, at very low cost. Um, and they've been doing this now for the best part of a decade. So they're well ahead of European competitors. Where we see the innovation in Europe is more focused on the high performance market and also on batteries that have better environmental and sustainability and governance targets. So we're really seeing companies like Northvolt in Sweden focusing in on that specific market, trying to build sustainable batteries to try and differentiate away from the very low cost. So I think globally what we're going to see is different areas, like different continents are going to focus on a different target market, whether it's sustainable batteries, high performance batteries, low cost. So... So it's really, again, dependent on what are you trying to achieve in your application? Is it cost? Is it sustainability? And therefore, there's a different supplier or a different continent that, that is best for you. And therefore, you are actually testing uh, all different kinds of battery cells. You are building up a whole library of uh, cells. How many different cells have you tested after all in all these years? Yeah, yeah. at this point, we've been going for about two years now. And in that time, we've tested a couple of hundred different batteries. They range in formats from cylindrical cells to pouch um, and even prismatic cells. And that covers chemistries ranging from the NNC, NCA, NMC, LFP chemistries. Um, and even looking ahead now at future chemistries like sodium ion, you probably heard talk of, um, and a new variation of the lithium ion phosphate chemistry with uh, magnesium LMFP. So a huge variety of cells, chemistries, formats, And that's allowed us to build out this uh, large database that we have today. You just mentioned the format, the chemistry. Um, what other characteristics are you looking for in a battery cell? What, what stuff can you test for? Yeah, so at a very high level, you're testing for things like the amount of energy a battery stores. So the, the battery energy uh, capacity, 
but also things like the resistance of the battery. Um, that really dominates how much heat it generates. So a battery with a high resistance will generate a lot of heat, and therefore you have to have an extra thermal management system. But our real unique proposition as a company is we, we measure a lot more nuanced properties of a battery, where we, also, we actually take the battery apart and we can measure things like how the lithium moves in the anode and the cathode, um, how the lithium moves through the electrolyte, what's the concentration gradients of, of lithium within a battery. So it can get very, very detailed and very specialist, but the real goal is to provide these measurements so that other people can design systems effectively. Who are you testing these uh, cells for? What's your business model? Are we talking some license fees for someone using your models, your, your library? So the main market is automotive. Um, about half of our customers are these multi-billion dollar automotive OEMs. So many of the, the like UK, German um, auto OEMs. Um, aside from that, we're also working with a number of big cell manufacturers. So again, these multi-billion dollar cell manufacturers. And then, then there's all the, the niche applications that you might not have considered, such as electric scooters, um, startup aerospace, so the flying robo-taxis, grid storage, portable chargers, consumer electronics. And we're actually working with a satellite company. So the same batteries that's used in a, a portable charger, they also go into small satellites for a, a range of applications. I bet your first clients, all these OEMs, they want to know how reliable the battery data sheet from the uh, cell manufacturer actually looks in reality, right? So that's your business model. You're testing these cells in reality. How much do they differ from, from the data sheets of the uh, cell manufacturer after all? Yeah, they can really vary. They can vary by as much as 10 or 15%, sometimes greater. And it's not because the manufacturers are lying on their data sheet. It's because the manufacturer will test their battery under one set of conditions. And then the, say the, the target customer will actually test their batteries under a different set of conditions. A, a good example would be measuring the capacity of a battery. So the way we measure the capacity of a battery is we, we bring the battery into our test lab. We plug it into a battery cycler, which is a, just a really fancy power supply. It charges and discharges the battery under very tightly controlled conditions and takes very accurate measurements along the way. And to measure the capacity, the first thing you do is you charge it to 100%. Um, and then you do a very, very slow discharge to discharge it the whole way to 0%. Um, but there's a few elements of nuance there, which is first charging a battery to 100%. That's really defined by the customer. Um, there, is no, there is no 100% for a battery. In, in theory, you can just keep charging a battery. And it will just keep accepting energy until it gets to a region where it becomes unsafe and it may um, vent gases, it may catch fire, etc. So, so people arbitrarily choose a number at which to, like voltage to charge it to. Um, so, so that can vary actually between manufacturer, between customer, like that charge level. And the same applies at the discharge level. So, so there is no upper limit, there's no lower limit. So how do you measure the capacity of a battery? So there's the first area that um, you can get inconsistency. And the second would be that typically when manufacturers, they, they generate this data, they, they do this charging and discharging in a convective environment in say like free air, for example. And as you charge and discharge the battery, it, it starts to heat up. So the, the outside of temperature of the battery might be at 25 degrees, but the inside temperature might be at 30, 35 degrees. And because the battery's got a little bit hotter, its resistance will have dropped and therefore you'll be able to extract more capacity. So if you don't control the temperature conditions very, very accurately, then you can lead to um, like incorrect capacity. So, so what we do is we have a standard protocol which defines 100%, defines 0%. We use this something called Peltier element control where we actually control the surface temperature of the battery um, actively. And that allows us to produce a better um, internal temperature in the battery and therefore more reliable capacity. So it's, it, there's a lot of nuance to battery testing. Um, and when people read a data sheet, it seems very simple. But is what we're trying to do is, is to take that complex complexity and keep it as simple as possible for the end customers. 
I don't want to reveal too much. You are as well offering a battery pack configurator. So you make it really uh, simple for the customer to choose a specific cell. That's why you're collecting so much data off the single cells. But let's first of all draw a slightly bigger picture here. Many European car companies are still importing many cells from Asia, but the construction of the battery pack um, they are building up in Europe already. What's the state of art strategy of European car manufacturers um, regarding that battery pack construction? The first big decision people have to make is what form factor to pick from. Like we've already discussed um, cylindrical, prismatic, power cells. So batteries come in a few different formats and they each have their strengths and weaknesses. Um, and it mainly comes at the system level. For example, a power cell is, is a battery that's sealed with very, very thin um, sheet of aluminium foil. So similar to what you'd use for cooking, actually. So if there's a, a like a thermal incident or a safety incident, that thin foil just rips apart instantly and can cause the fire to spread within a battery pack. Um, but because it's a very thin foil, it, it reduces the weight of the system. So, so the first thing... Um, a battery pack designer has to do is choose the form factor that meets their safety requirements, but also their the like weight targets of their system. And then from there, they need to decide how to integrate them batteries together. So how many do you plug in series and how many do you plug in parallel? And then you get on to how do you charge and discharge it safely? What measurements do you take? You can't afford to measure every single temperature in the battery pack. So you have to just choose a few. We provide these digital models. And the models are really a digital version of the real life battery. So instead of having to charge and discharge it in real life, you can now charge and discharge it virtually through simulation. And that allows people to, you know, try 15, 20 different designs of a battery pack in one afternoon, rather than having to spend two million pounds and spend six months doing that. So, so it's this kind of innovation in the virtual um, space allows people then to optimize and further their, their design. Let me see if I got that right. You're offering a um, a cell library as well as that um, battery pack configurator. And these two models, they go into another, they work with another. And at the end, there is a perfect battery pack uh, setup, a design that you're, yeah, you're uh, suggesting towards uh, the OEM. Um, I ask myself how much work from outer from external engineers is necessary after all oh, oh a huge amount so what we're what we're aiming to provide is really the the tools and the building blocks so so think of it like the lego bricks about energy would give you all the lego bricks you need to to build whatever you need to build um so you could build a castle you could build a house um but that's really core to what we're doing we we don't want to develop ip for our customers we want them to build their own IP using our building blocks. The digital models we provide, for example, they're, they can be used and configured in any way the customer wants. And the battery pack design tool we have, the customer puts in their requirements and it produces outputs for them. Um, so they can kind of configure that however they like. Could you once more uh, tell our I would say non-scientific listeners once more, what does a model actually do? I mean, we're now talking not about a cell model, we're talking about a pack model. It includes stuff like cooling, it includes the BMS, I guess, um, the weight, the mass, whatever, um, of the single cells. Isn't that way complex? Oh, they're hugely complex, yeah. And to give you a, a size or a scale of the complexity, these simulations of a full battery pack, the simulation can take weeks to solve on a computer. So hugely expensive simulations. But, but yeah, what, what these models are is they're a, a digital version of the, the real life battery. And they model everything, as you described, from the electrical field to the, the thermal, like how much heat is generated, how that heat dissipates. And they do all of this in a highly coupled, iterative manner. So every time step that moves forward, every one second of simulation is calculating the new battery resistances, the new current flow, the new heat generation, the new temperature distribution. And then it loops back around on itself and it does that all over again for the next time step. And this can happen across, as you said, there are like hundreds of different cells in a large battery pack with a coolant system that's cooling the battery. 
Um, and it seems like this is really complex and expensive, but can you imagine having to build 10 different battery packs in real life with all the safety, the manufacturing? So it's, yeah, a couple of days or a couple of weeks of simulation compared to, you know, months or even years of having to do that in real life. So, so yeah, it's hugely innovative and it's really driving the, um, the development of these products forward much faster. As an outsider, I um, would have thought this uh, was a bit faster. Um, on your website, it says rapid cell selection. Um, yeah, it does take weeks, right, to build the entire pack and to have a full design you just mentioned, right? So that, that would be a very late stage design, doing a full battery pack simulation. Um, as you've seen on our website, we provided a, a suite of web tools. So we have this battery pack configuration tool that you talked about. And its goal is to really help at the opposite end of the spectrum, like the very early stage design, the kind of design where it's, you know, four or five people sitting in a room um, hashing out a concept, like should the battery pack have, um, I don't know, 60 kilowatts hours of energy or should it have 80? And you can very quickly prototype different designs, get an idea of how much might that battery pack weigh, how much might it cost, what would the system performance of it be? So, so what we're doing is, is really providing the, the tools, very user-friendly web tools to help with that very early stage design, but then taking our customers on a journey where we provide more and more advanced simulation tools. In the recent years, we've seen multiple innovations uh, on cell-to-pack design in China. BYD is in the forefront of that innovation. How do you deal with that? Um, the traditional setup of a battery is cell, module, and pack. Um, how often do you suggest battery pack setups without modules? Yeah, well, it comes with huge benefit and huge trade-offs, right? Like the benefit, as you described there, is it's a lot simpler. You go straight from the cell to the pack but the trade-offs are often safety implications. Like there's a very good reason that most battery cars have modules that break a 600 volt battery pack down into chunks of 50, 60 volts. Um, and that's for good reason because at like 50, 60 volts, it's, it's dangerous, but it's not quite life-threatening. And so you can have that, you can have technicians and engineers work on their products, design and build them in a much safer environment. And then at the very final step of building the car, you connect them all together. Um, what, what, what we've seen with cell to pack is that they're just going straight from the cell the whole way to the pack. And that has a very, very different safety implication. So now from a manufacturing standpoint, from an engineering testing development standpoint, it really increases the, the risk and there's a trade-off there. So. So as always, there's a trade-off between one design and another, and it's, you've got to really look at the big picture to understand what's better in a certain context. But um, it does enable higher energy densities, correct? Uh, yes, it does. At, at a full system level, it can enable higher energy densities because you don't have the overhead of having the, the modules, all the different connectors, etc. So, so it offers a lot of potential. And yeah, I think it's very exciting, especially the innovations being made by BYD and other, other Chinese uh, automakers. Absolutely. But let's go uh, two steps back here. Um, without you guys offering your services, how is that traditionally working? If I wanted to build a battery pack from scratch without you guys, how does that work in general? I mean, isn't that a huge task? Yeah, yeah it's a huge task. And at these big companies, there's, you know, hundreds of people working on these type of projects. And and actually, that's our main main competitor, you might say, is that it's in-house companies developing this sort of capability in-house. And, and when we were starting the company, we spoke to a huge amount of industry participants, like software companies, um, automotive OEMs, motorsports companies. And what we realized is actually all of these companies were repeating a very similar activity in-house, which is they're buying batteries, they're testing them, they, they use the data to build these models and and it's actually a very difficult process, like testing and modeling batteries is actually very, very, very difficult. So, so we've seen the opportunity to centralize this and drive down the cost for our customers. So we really pitch it as a huge cost saving to our customers where we do it at much higher accuracy, we do it much faster, much more repeatedly, and a much lower cost than, than they can individually do in-house. 
Gavin, tell us about your uh, project with Porsche. You did not build the entire pack yourself. You just mentioned that you did the modeling. Is that the same case with Porsche? Yeah, so, so Porsche is really exciting for us. It's the only customer that we can publicly talk about. The battery industry is extremely secretive, but our relationship with Porsche, there's elements of it that are public. Um, so we did a, a case study with them um, through the plug and play Autobahn accelerator last year where we developed um, electrochemical models for Porsche. Um, so an electrochemical model is the type of model that models how the lithium moves within a battery. And by modeling that, you can do very advanced things like develop fast charging algorithms, so how to charge a battery really quickly without degrading its lifetime, but also do very advanced degradation modeling. So how can you optimize the lifetime of that battery the whole way over a five, 10 year period? We know the Porsche Taycan can charge at speeds like 270 kilowatts. Um, that is amazing. But on the other hand, um, you can't um, yeah, um, put on 370, for example, then you're going to probably harm the battery, correct? So my question is, how do you evolve these charging algorithms? How do you um, pretty much get to know that you are harming uh, the state of health? How does that work? Yeah, that's a very complex question. And, and what we've seen across all of the auto manufacturers is that they, they limit the charging speeds and they limit the performance of the electric vehicles to make sure that they don't damage them. Because raising them performance limits has the risk that they could damage the batteries and that they might not meet the warranty obligations. They might become unsafe and that might damage their, their reputation. So... So a lot of companies now are, are looking towards innovation and external innovation as to how they can understand batteries better, how they can push the performance envelopes. So, so yeah, I think across the whole automotive industry, we've seen very conservative like performance figures compared to what batteries are actually capable of. Whereas I think what we're going to see over, over the next five years is then performance limits get stretched through better understanding and better software. Let me um, do a quick recap here. You're uh, working for OEMs that use your battery pack model. My question is, when is your job actually finished? Um, I guess these OEMs always want uh, this model to be evolved and um, further develop their battery packs, right? So is that, again, a license fee that is um, just there <laughs> or are you visiting all these oems with special needs or i don't know are you working specifically on one battery model there's a com complete continuous need from um, like not just big auto OEMs, but even small electric scooter or grid storage companies because new batteries are continuously becoming available in the market and designs are constantly being um, iterated whether that's like a production design and that a customer sees, or whether that's research and development, there's always constant battery R&D activity, design activity, that um, requires a continual need for battery data um, and battery models. When I come back to formats here, so uh, cylindrical pouch and um, prismatic cells, do you see a bigger picture in the market um, for example, that um, pouch is getting less and less and prismatic is gaining height here? Yeah, yeah we've definitely seen that. Um, like pouch cells were definitely the, the, the cell of choice like five years ago, but now much more of a shift towards large format cylindrical and prismatic cells. Um, and we really believe that's mainly driven by safety. And um, like Elon Musk very famously has said that himself, like that's why they chose cylindrical cells because they're encased in a, in a hard case, they're much easier to contain, much easier to get good safety on, and yet they still meet the performance requirements of the, the battery. But, but there's always then these applications where you know, pouch cells are better. So, so they're, they're definitely not going to go away. Pouch cells will remain. It will just depend on yeah, the requirements of that system. But, but yeah, huge, huge shift towards larger formats of prismatic and cylindrical cells. Mm -hmm. And could you differentiate here between uh, the electromobility and stationary batteries? Is that the same? Um, yeah, sometimes there's an overlap, but there's also quite clear segmentation now. So in, this, in the stationary space, it's, it doesn't really matter how heavy the battery is. It's all about the cost per energy stored. Um, and when you 
are optimizing for that, then the lithium ion phosphate chemistry really dominates in that area. Like it's very, very low cost. There's not many um, precious metals inside that chemistry. Um, whereas on the other end of the spectrum, like NMC chemistries, NCAs, that's like nickel, manganese, cobalt, um, precious metals, very expensive, but they're much more energy dense. So in the e-mobility space, you often see these higher performance chemistries um, dominating just because they're more energy dense. And then in the, the kind of cost market, which would be the like grid storage or the ESS market, it's more um, like LFP and, and looking into the future, hopefully even sodium ion cells. I was going to mention that. I took a quick glimpse uh, at your um, vault cell library. I did not find a single sodium ion cell, but probably for the future. Do you think that's a promising uh, cell chemistry, especially for stationary batteries? Hugely promising. Uh, we've already started testing the sodium ion cells, so it should hopefully be in the vault um, in the next few weeks or months, um, which is really exciting. It's a very new chemistry onto the market. Like sodium ion as a technology has been around for two decades, but only now is it being commercialized at scale at very low cost. Um, we've seen the announcement from Northvolt, I think it was towards the end of last year, that they've developed a sodium ion cell. I think due to launch in production in 2027. Um, and really the unique thing they've developed there is they've produced a sodium ion cell that is free from precious metals. And so it's not only is it going to remain low cost long term, but it doesn't have the supply chain risks that come with other chemistries. You know, like a lot of precious metals, for example, come from um, just a few individual companies. Or countries so so yeah hugely exciting on the sodium ion front and i think it's going to really dominate the like stationary energy storage market but also um hopefully low cost automotive in the future so no lithium no nickel no cobalt involved yeah let's stick with northvolt here uh as I understand, your business model is targeted towards OEMs in terms of um, they want their purchased cells being tested before. But wouldn't it be interesting to work together with cell manufacturers themselves in order to let their fresh cells be tested by you towards the market? Isn't that something? Yeah, it's hugely exciting and a lot of area that of for potential gains as well is taking them simulation-based approaches that are used in automotive and bringing that now to the actual cell chemistry and the cell design. So like I said earlier, we're already working with a very large cell manufacturing company um, to help them optimize some of the cell design characteristics. Um, could be the electrode thicknesses, could be the porosity or the particle sizes within the electrodes. Um, and then also helping them downstream, helping them get their customers to understand their technology. So instead of having to send them real samples, they can send them like virtual samples and do a lot of them experiments. So yeah, huge, huge area of opportunity. And we're speaking to a, a number of the world's biggest cell manufacturers, which is really exciting. Sounds really exciting. I'm wondering a little bit, uh, since these manufacturers of cells are uh, traditionally huge, so we're talking Samsung, like thousands of engineers over there, why do they need a tiny European uh, company to test their cells? Even Northworld is quite big. Uh, don't they have uh, engineers themselves that do that inside their companies? Yeah, so you're completely right on cell testing, that they have capabilities that Cell testing requires a lot of capex, so building a test lab, hiring some technicians and engineers to do the testing. But the key difference is the modeling work. So taking raw test data and turning that into a model, that is extremely difficult and extremely nuanced. Like most people, and even when I started battery research, I just assumed that all these big companies like Samsung, Panasonic, LG, that they would have really deep expertise in how batteries work in order to to develop them, but it's a really core misunderstanding as to how batteries are developed. So batteries come from the world of material science. And in the world of material science, it's very empirical development. Basically mix it together, see what happens, test it, mix again, see what happens. For good reason, because how materials are combined together is still a bit of a dark art, to be honest. And I can give you a real world example, which would be baking. So when you bake a cake, for example, there isn't two cakes that you'll ever make in your life will ever come out the exact same. Like the materials are just slightly different. The temperature, the humidity, the pressure is slightly different. 
and that changes very subtly how the materials are developed. So, so cell manufacturers have really focused on this empirical development, just build things and just tweak the design um, through testing. So that fundamental understanding and modeling, they didn't necessarily have that. What we've proven in the market is that we're world leaders at that modeling activity. And so we're working with a number of these manufacturers to help them accelerate their development. And it's not an us fee them in terms of internal departments. It's, you know, how can we aid the current path that you're already on and how can we work together? So it's more collaborative uh, than it is competitive. Very interesting to hear. I didn't know that, that uh, these huge companies are not necessarily focusing on modeling. Last question for you, Gavin, in this podcast. Um, I've read on um, your white box approach on your model. I'm mixing it up a little bit with um, open source modeling. What's the difference between t these two things? So open source is when all of the code, all of the data is just available and you can go and edit all of the data and all of the code. Uh, white box is an in-between where all of the mathematics is published. So basically you can read a paper which details all of the mathematics, all of the equations, but sometimes the code is obscured. So sometimes there can be a lot of IP in the code, like how you solve an equation very efficiently, there can be IP in there. So what we do with white box is we provide all of the data that people can see, they can edit, they can see all of the mathematics of what's been solved, all the equations. And a lot of the times they can also edit them equations. But in some cases, what we hold back is some of the computational code to turn the equations into a model. Um, and there is some IP in there. So that's really one of our main competitive strengths as a company is this white box solution where people can see what's going on. They can understand it, which is great for their own education, but also gives them confidence in the model. Thank you so much for this talk. This was Gavin White from About Energy. Dear listeners, any questions left? If so, please drop them in the comment section below. That's it for today. Thanks for watching. Gavin White, all the best. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, Patrick.